<laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, good morning yeah. or good evening, depending on when this is going to be transmitted. And uh, I'm, it's uh, really a pleasure to be with you, and I'd like to talk about Algorand and more, and more generally about you know, blockchains. So let me try to uh, share my screen and we can start uh, going. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, here we go about you know, um, 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 an Algorand and, uh, and blockchain in general. I really uh, want to uh, thank you very much for uh, this opportunity. And again, I convey my best wishes for a very successful conference. And in fact, one of many, and we should get uh, together uh, more often. So today I want to talk about uh, the blockchains uh, versus uh, cycle, okay? So um, it is um, something that it goes like this. So there is going to be reality, aspiration, acceptance, and technology. Let me explain. Very often we are going to have a new goal. We start with a new goal. And somehow our aspiration is so strong that somehow we convince ourselves that we already achieved the new goal. This is the self-deception state. At some point, we finally come to our senses. You know what? The emperor has no clothes. Our goal does not yet exist. The acceptance stage that we are not done yet is a very important because finally we wake up, we roll our sleeves and we go to work. Let's get serious. And once we are at this stage, once we get serious and we, we can develop new technology and find the solution um, uh, so that our aspirations finally becomes a reality. I'd like to give you three examples of this virtual cycles. One is uh, um, about consensus, smart contracts, and interoperability. Let me start with consensus. The aspiration is very clear. We want to have a decentralized database, a blockchain, in fact, that is readable by everyone, writable by everyone, and inalterable by anyone. The potential is very clear. Uh, who does not like a database that cannot be altered by bad people? Who does not like transparency? Who does not like the ability to generate trust between the people who barely know each other? The applications are really unlimited. The challenge, what is really hard to decentralize, is not securing the chain. That is very prehistoric technology in cryptography does this. You take a block, you hash it, and the hash of the previous block is the first entry in your new block. That secures the chain. Inalterability is easily guaranteed. The whole question is, who chooses the next block? How is this process done? And really here is where the aspiration fights becomes different from technology. In the self-deception is really very clear because everybody says, take over, save yourself. A big wave of decentralization is up on us. And journalists, consultants, sociologists, anthropologists, the general public has been talking for a long, long time about this uh, decentralized waves, which you know is nowhere to be seen. They were talking about the blockchains as if we were already decentralized. Decentralized where? I don't see any decentralization tsunami coming in. So finally, Buterin, uh, the co-founder of Ethereum, set the record straight with his famous trilemma, which means that, you know, at the most, two out of the following three properties can be satisfied in a blockchain. Security, decentralization, scalability. Okay, thank you, Buterin, for declaring that we are not yet done. And the trilem has been a very important step. And it's fact, it was one that somehow motivated me to get into the field. But the trilem is not acceptable. Why? Because which property are you willing to sacrifice? Security? Oh, nobody likes an insecure blockchain. Decentralization? Well, if you are, don't care about decentralization, why are you interested in blockchain to begin with? Scalability? Well, unless you plan 
to use your blockchain among friends and family, you do care about scalability. There are no good choices in, in Vetra Lemma. Fortunately, Vetra Lemma is false. It actually has been true for a decade and has been empirically true for a 2000 and change blockchain. But the fact of it being true for so long and for so many examples does not make it really true. So let's see why this is the case. When you look at the typical blockchain, the first ones were based on proof of work. Roughly, the first one to solve a very hard cryptographic riddle chooses the next block on behalf of all of us. As we know, this proof of work becomes ultimately centralized because when the, the cost of solving the riddle becomes harder and harder and harder, fewer and fewer people can afford this cost, so much so that in the blockchain, say, of uh, Bitcoin, two or three money in pool really control the chain. The other favorite approach is a delegated proof of stake, which essentially can be summarized as choose 21 people who then choose the next block on behalf of all of us. Well, if Bitcoin was ultimately became centralized, delegated proof of stake is centralized by design. It starts being centralized, continues to be centralized, can be centralized, it will be, remain centralized. Bonded proof of stake means delegate the power of choosing the block to those who put money hostage in the middle of a table. This is de facto centralized. Why? Because the money that people can put in the middle of a table, hostage, can only be a small fraction of the total amount of money in the system. I mean, money wants to be productive. It doesn't want to be hostage in the middle of the table. So very few people are be the ones who are going to be subjected themselves and their money to be hostage. And therefore, this is... Uh, uh, we are going to put, you know, um, is a centralized system also. I could continue with other type of approaches, but uh, let me speak about uh, the flawed logic, which was these approaches. The logic was this. The whole economy is secure if the majority of a small piece of economists are honest. Do you find this puzzling? I do. And you, do, you should do too, because here is the big economy in red, and the green part is the small piece of economy that you want to remain honest for the whole economy to work. What is the small piece? These are the miners in Bitcoin. These are the delegates in delegated proof of stake, and so on and so forth. So let me tell you, that a different logic, which is the one, the logic that Algorand has, um, 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 has, uh, has been used, is this, the following. But first of all, there are no tokens which are hostage anywhere. The tokens are always uh, in your wallet, invested in whatever opportunity the blockchain offers you. And every token has the same power than any other token. Not my token is more powerful than you. I'm a delegate, my token has power. You are not a delegate, your token does not power. Every token has the same power in consensus. And uh, security comes when most of the tokens are in honest hands. Not most of the tokens on the middle of the table hostage. Not most of the, uh, um, uh, of the tokens in a small universe, but Overall, in other words, if you want to make Algorand insecure, a majority of the token holders had to get together so to destroy the very economy of which they own the majority of. I think this is a better logic. And so let me tell you a little bit about Algorand consensus. As you know, very often consensus has been diluted, has been an eventual consensus. Why? Because when you attach your block to my block, you essentially are voting that I believe in Silvio's block and somebody will vote on your block. But you need to wait a longer and longer a number of blocks be added to yours because there may be a fork and you never know which of the two forks sur survives. So you will get to consensus 
by evidence, more and more and more evidence is a diluted consensus. Algorand consensus instead is based on Byzantine agreement, which by the way, is consensus in the most adversarial setting as um, um, originally proposed by Lamport, Peace and Schott. And so what is Byzantine agreement? It's a communication protocol that if the majority of the participants are honest, guarantees two fundamental property. The first one is the agreement property, which means that no matter which values we start, at the end of the discussion, all the honest participants will agree on a common value, on the same value. And I hope that you figure out who is honest or who is not dishonest in the picture. The second property is consistency, which means not only the honest people must agree on a common value, but if it happens that everybody starts with the same value, then all honest people must, ag must agree on that very value, not another, but on the one which they started with. All right. By the way, that is some challenges of the Byzantine agreement is that is very slow, namely the maximum number of participants in any practical Byzantine agreement was 12, and now we want a, a, a consensus in which uh, millions or billions of participants participate, and also suffered from the fact that Byzantine agreement presupposes the number of players is fixed and is known in, in advance. And in a permissionless blockchain where people can come and go, the, first of all, you don't want anything slow, and second of all, the number of players is not fixed in advance. So we must uh, do something to make a really Byzantine agreement available on a planetary scale and unparalleled efficiency. But assume that we, we do, which means that it's not the diluted consensus. We are going to agree on one block, and once we agree on one block, we agree on the next block, and then we agree on the block after that, and never change our mind. The blockchain does not fork. Let's see this in action. There is a favor to symbolize lightness and effortlessness, and there is the first block, the Genesis block, and you start producing one block, agreeing after the other, after the other, after the other, in a linear fashion. How about forks? How about proof of work? No forks and no proof of work. So the absence of fork guarantees the transaction finality, meaning once you see that you have been paid in one block, you know that this block never will leave the Algorand blockchain, so you may ship the goods right away. And the absence of making proof of work means that participation is easy. The bar of entry to participate to the consensus protocol is so low that anybody with an ordinary laptop can be actively participating into consensus. Let me tell you how this works. Algorand proceeds in two magic phases where the magic is actually replaced by mathematics and uh, it works as follows. First, there is a proposal phase which by magic, a random token is selected among all tokens in, in circulation. The corresponding public key becomes by magic known to all users and the user who owns that public key digitally chooses a block, digitally signs and then propagates to the, net, to the network. And you say, that's my proposal for the new block. End of phase one. Phase two, the agreement phase. By magic, a thousand tokens are randomly selected among all participants. Their key, or all tokens are in circulation. Uh, these uh, tokens must belong to some keys. These keys becomes common knowledge to, uh, to all users, and the owners of these keys are the members of a committee who actually runs a, the special Byzantine agreement of Algorand to agree on the block proposed by the first user. So the first phase tells you the target. That's what we're trying to agree upon. But you are not sure that uh, we have seen the same block. So the agreement phase ensures that there is reaching agreement on this block. Hmm, let me give you some sanity check. Sanity check one. Remember, we want to do 
consistency. Consistent means that, let's assume that everybody starts with the same value, starts with the same block proposed. Okay, there is a billion people, some are bad, some are good, but everybody starts with the same value. Then, if everybody starts with the same value, and you choose a committee at random, by choosing the tokens at random, or roughly a thousand people, why I say less than, a, 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 or a thousand, because maybe two of your tokens are selected. Not only one token of yours has been selected, but two tokens of yours have been selected. So you have two votes in this committee. Now you have a much smaller committee. Okay, but in this smaller committee, everybody starts with the same value. And if there is a, a majority of good players in the billion people, and this majority is large enough, there is going to be a majority of honest players in the smaller committee. And therefore, once you do in this smaller committee Byzantine agreement, the consistency property of the Byzantine agreement will imply that all honest participants agree on the block. And what do they do with this committee? They digitally sign the block and propagate it. So if you are a spectator and you see one, and you see that who are the members of this committee, and you see a block, say a thousand members, and you see a block that has a digital signature of say 700 of these 1,000 members, you say, gee, this is the new block. And consistency is satisfied. Check. Okay. Assume now the agreement. The agreement means that if you don't start among a billion people with everybody having the same value, when you randomly select a restriction of a, a thousand players, they don't have the same value either. But the agreement property of, uh, of the, Byzant the agreement property of the Byzantine agreement tells you that at the end of a conversation, even though these one thousand people don't start with the same value, they will agree on the same value. And in some sense, you can see that also agreement works. So even though fewer people participate to the agreement, the fundamental properties of consistency and agreement work when you restrict the committee and from a billion, you bring it to 1,000. And the last funny check, you're going to say, gee, you need to have you know, a two-thirds majority to have agreement. Okay, that only means that uh, you must have a, a little bit a larger majority. I'm making it up, three quarters. Any fixed amount of greater than two-thirds will work, but if you want to have a committee which are not too small, say you make it a large enough, three quarters implies that now you have a planetary, very fast agreement, which is really agreement in the, in the, in the sense of... Uh, of uh, um, uh, of uh, the original sense of uh, Lampard, Peace, and Shostak. Very good. Okay, at this point, we've done some rough finally check. It's time for Q&A. And the first uh, um, uh, question that comes to mind is that who chooses the committee? Because the committee has the power really to run the agreement. And um, in Algorand, the committee is chosen by cryptographic sorticians means that the committee members choose themselves. On the face of it, that seems to be a terrible idea because if I'm bad, of course I will choose myself. I want to be part of the committee. And my bad friends also want to choose themselves. So we are going to pack the committee of bad people. Well, but not, that's not how cryptographic sortition work. It's cryptographic sortition means yes, you select yourself, but you are obliged to select yourself at random by means of a cryptographically fair lottery, which means that you cannot cheat even though you are extremely powerful, even though, though you own all the computer on the planet Earth, you cannot improve your chances of being selected. And therefore, when you run this lottery, there are two cases. Think about like in a slot machine, pulling down the lever, you can pull it only once and two cases happens. If you win, you get a, a winning ticket, a mathematical proof that you actually won. So listen to my opinion, I'm a member of this committee. And the winners, what do they do? 
they propagate their winning tickets and their opinions, their vote on the block, up or down. Okay, so now let me tell you that this is actually super decentralized. Why? Because you run a lever for each token that you have, therefore every token has a chance to being to win uh, the lottery and so that is so decentralized that every token has the same probability of any other token to participate to consensus. Then now is superly scalable. Why is this superly scalable? How long does it take to run the lottery? One microsecond. And if I have a thousand uh, tokens, by more mathematics, still one microsecond. And if I have a billion tokens, also one microsecond. So in one microsecond, you are done to figure out who wins and who loses. And uh, the 1,000 that they won the lottery, what do they do? They have to propagate the winning ticket and their opinion about the block. Can you propagate a thousand messages? Yes. That's why it's super scalable. Why now is also super secure. Why is this super secure? Because if I am a very powerful adversary, Assume that I'm so powerful that I can corrupt any 1,000 people I want just by snapping my fingers. Whom do I want to corrupt? The committee, of course, so that I can let them agree on whatever I want. But I have a problem. I do not know whom I should corrupt. This lady in Shanghai, this guy in Paris, I have no idea because I must corrupt the winners of a cryptographic lottery, but I don't know who will win the lottery. So, but wait a second. After people win the lottery, once you have a thousand winners, you will figure out who they are because they propagate their winning ticket and their opinion about the block. And at that point, you can corrupt them. Yeah. But at that point, it's too late to corrupt them, right? Because once I figure out whom I should corrupt is because they are virally propagating their winning ticket and their opinion about the block. And I cannot put, pull back in the bottle a message that I, is virally propagated over the internet. So essentially, that is in essence why the trilemma is solved at a very high level. So the second question is say, well, now you have a thousand players, but yet to run Byzantine agreement, you said that the maximum was 12 players. Well, maximum was 12 players for prior Byzantine agreement. But the one that we had developed is really super fast. And um, so the other question to say, so wait a second, even though it's super fast, you are going to take how many steps? Say four steps five steps, all right. I buy your argument that I cannot corrupt the people doing the first step because I don't know yet who they are. And once they show who they are and they propagate their first message, I cannot touch these messages. But if I corrupt them now, I can influence what these one thousand people are going to say in the second step, in the third step, and in the fourth step. And this may be enough to corrupt the entire Byzantine Agreement protocol. But that's not the way it works. Because what we are, going, we are doing in Algorand is that we choose a separate committee for each step. So step one is made by 1,000 people chosen at random. And step two is made by a different set of 1,000 people chosen at random. And step three by a different set of 1,000 people chosen at random. So even if I go out to the first step, I have no, that gives me no advantage for the second step. But it says, oh, gee, if this is true, you have another problem, uh, Silvio. Namely, what kind of meaningful conversation, what kind of meaningful protocol can be run step by step by totally independent random people? That is not a conversation. That is really nonsense. Well, turns out that the same 
Byzantine agreement protocol that is so fast as actually a much more fundamental property. Namely, it is player replaceable. And player replaceability means that the protocol remains meaningful and indeed secure when players are randomly selected at each step without knowing who were the people before them, without sharing any variables with them, without being at, at, at all totally different people. So it is really a miracle that the fastest Byzantine agreement protocol is also player replaceable because now we can somehow implement the protocol like this. I must say that I've been a, a cryptography, I'm afraid to reveal, for uh, 40 years. And uh, I never thought about player replace replaceability to be really the, about this property. Who needed to define something if you don't even have a, a thought that it might be implementable? It's really a miracle that there exist uh, uh, player, uh, player replaceable protocols. So let me show here what this means, right? Assume the protocol takes four steps. Sometimes it's probabilistic, sometimes it's like three, sometimes like four, sometimes like five. So there are different committee for each step, a brown committee, a red committee, blue committee, black committee, and so on and so forth. Let me see if we understood. What is the relationship between these different players? And the answer is none, because they are randomly selected and they didn't know about each other. They didn't agree on what to say. If you are selected, so I say so. They are totally different players. Moreover, they are in different numbers, of course, because each one of them runs a, um, um, runs a lottery. The lottery is adjusted so that on average you have a thousand players, but sometimes you can have 1,100 players, sometimes you can have 950 players, and so on and so forth. And moreover, they have no shared variable. And yet, even though these are different people, without sharing variables in different numbers, they act as if the entire protocol were generated by the same committee, but the big adva advantage is the adversary cannot really corrupt them because they are totally different protocols at every step. And that means really to be distributed. So if you look at this, after we acknowledge that we have the problem with consensus, after we acknowledge that we don't have yet a solution, that is a great point because now we are ready to develop a new tech and finally find a solution. In this case, the reconciliation of security, scalability, and decentralization. Much more quickly, I'd like to show that something similar happens for smart contracts. The aspiration of smart contracts is very high. What are smart contracts? Are contracts among mutually distrusting parties that automatically execute themselves when the right conditions are, arise. Wow, the potentials of smart contracts is immense. The opportunities are unlimited because you can have transactions without any mediators which are secure. You can eliminate financial friction. Financial friction, by the way, accounts for 6% of the global GDP. Let me tell you that no country can pass the opportunity to enable its citizens to interact securely with one, with one another without financial friction. It is hard even for a developed country uh, to find such an opportunity for GDP growth. But as we said, the potential being great, the aspiration of the technology are two different things. And in fact, a layer two smart contracts, even though they've been proposed ever since, you know, Ethereum for a long time, layer two smart contracts are very expensive, very slow, and very fragile. No day goes by with, without somebody declaring that unfortunately they lost on a million dollars or, or, or so for some uh, bad uh, smart contract. So, Algo and solution to this uh, problem is to develop a new type of smart contracts. Layer one smart contracts and smarter layer two smart contracts. The smarter layer two smart contracts, we'll call them smart square contracts because they are smarter smart contracts. But you know what? I will talk about them another time. They deserve their own talk. 
Today, I really want to talk to you about something uh, simpler, which is a layer one smart contract. Simpler in to describe, but actually technologically and very challenging. Okay, what are Algorand layers one smart contract? First of all, they are smart contracts, but they have a difference. They are executed at the very consensus level, okay? So which means the consensus level is the most secure in any blockchain. And moreover, they are executed at the consensus level without slowing down block generation. You can execute 1,000 layer one smart contracts in Algorand without slowing down the block. A second, right? 1,000 smart contracts a second, ba 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 ba. It doesn't stop your block generation. And essentially, these are smart contracts which have the same efficiency and the same security as ordinary payment. All right. So let me tell you the example of an atomic swap. An atomic swap is atomic in the sense of being indivisible. You want actions that cannot be separated. There is a blue user who has a blue asset, and there is a red user who has a red asset. The blue user asset could be a house, and the red user asset could be money, and you want to exchange the house for money. Of course, the problem is, who goes first? Who gives them the asset first? Do I send you the house or do you send me the money? Nobody wants to go first. So that's why people use trusted mediators. But do you want to use a trusted mediator? No. First of all, because they are very costly. They want 6% of a transaction. And second of all, because they are very rare. If you are in China and I am here in, in Massachusetts, we may not know uh, somebody like Xiao Tie that we both trust to uh, execute, uh, uh, to give the assets to. So then what do we do? How about a traditional layer two smart contract? We just said that they were slow, costly and fragile. No thanks. How about hash time locks? Well, whatever they are, never mind. They are also slow. And by the way, they are vulnerable to denial of service attack. So what do we do in Algorand is that we use essentially a single transaction we are able to couple the transaction so that it doesn't matter if I push my button first or if you push your button first, these transactions are going to happen together or not at all. So the advantage of having a single transaction is that there is no cheating. And there is actually a sense of, of uh, no errors because uh, in, in layer one, uh, things are much more uh, uh, secure. And, um, and they are really an ideal uh, trade, um, and somehow it's not only a question of atomic swaps. You can tokenize assets in Algorand, um, um, also layer one. You can have a, co a collateralized loan, a layer one. You can have auctions, a layer one. Who knew that there was so much room, a layer one? This layer one is very spacious. All kinds of things come in. In fact, actually, maybe some 90% of whatever you want to do for smart concepts can be done on layer one. And for everything else, we have this smart square contracts that we can talk about another time. So once again, it is a technology that wins the day and we must, however, first of all, realize we have a problem, otherwise we continue thinking that you have already solved the, the, the smart contract problem and nobody has incentives, technological incentives to create something new. And now let's talk about interoperability. Okay, why do we want interoperability? Because no chain is an island. In other words, the world outside is always larger than the world inside, also by definition. Who said this? Well, I do, okay? So, if your blockchain is incapable of interoperate with other blockchain, you'll make yourself the first prisoner of your own castle. The aspiration of interoperability is great. Is it is guaranteeing the decentralized, secure and efficient interoperability among different chains. Just think of what is this. Every chain has different technology. I have an asset that I want to trade and, and I want to go to the blockchain that has the best technology for what I want to do. And then after that, I put back my assets where I wanted. I can pick and choose the best from every blockchain. Interoperability benefits are really unlimited. When we talk about interoperability, among whom? 
there are two cases, chains that run the same consensus protocol and chains that run different consensus protocol. In the first case, we, at, at Algorand, we, we, we call the first case core chains and the second case, case token bridge. Let me describe them both. Core chains. What is a core chain? It's an independent chain. You run your own consensus, you have your own validators. It is a private chain. Whatever happens inside your chain is not seen by the outside world. And, but you run the same consensus as what? As the main chain. Okay, and which consensus should you run? Well, hopefully one that is scalable, secure, and distributed, one that has layer one smart contracts, one that enjoys transaction finality. Let me give you a hint. If you run Algo, you're going to be good. Okay. Okay, so here is an interaction between a blue co-chain and a main chain. And assume that you know, I want to transfer a blue asset, A, from the blue chain to the main chain. Why do I want to transfer an asset? Oh, because maybe I want to sell my asset. And by the way, there are very strict theorems in economics that tells you that the price that you expect to receive is much higher the higher the number of potential bidders. And if you want to sell to, in a private chain, you have a small number of bidders, but if you sell, transfer the asset for sale only on the main chain, you can actually have a much wider set of bidders and you can repatriate more money back, whatever currency you want. Very good. So that makes sense to, to do this. It also makes sense to have interaction between core chain and core chain, a blue chain and a red chain. Assume the blue chain as a blue asset, A, the red chain as a, a, a red asset, B, and they want to exchange it. And what do they do? First, they transfer an asset to the main chain, but, and they don't transfer it just to the chain, they transfer it to a public key of their own choosing. And this public key, they are random use ones public key. Okay, now these assets sit on the chain and if the main chain is equipped with the legendary layer one atomic swaps that I tell you, in seconds you can swap them and then you can repatriate the new asset. Now B became blue and A has become red. And that, so the, the main chain allows this transaction to occur but also allows for something else. It prevents double spending. Because the main chain remembers B now is in, in the blue chain and A is in the red chain. So if the blue chain wants to sell A to somebody else by transferring to the main chain, uh, uh, uh oh, sorry, but you no longer possess it. Okay, got it. The main chain becomes a hub for a bunch of private co-chain and allows their interoperability. Okay, let's do some fast Q&A. Are co-chain hubs new? No, I mean, <laughs> if you want to register the idea of a hub is a long line and the line is so long that you better get a taxi to, if you want to stand online. Are all hubs equal? Absolutely not. Why? Because a, a hub, is only as good as the infrastructure you find there. So take, for instance, the example of airline hubs. Assume you have a hub, what do you need? You need mechanics to work on your plane where they're broken. You need hangars so that your plane can be serviced. You need hotels so that your crew can sleep and be refreshed for the next flight. And if you have a hub that only offers you free ice cream, it's not the same. So you choose this hub. Okay, so which hub, where the tech is? So in, you know, here is the tech that I like, verifiable random function, cryptographic sorticians, or vault, et cetera, et cetera. And but let me ask you a more important question. Are co-chain solution decentralizable? Let me say yes. I'm not going to argue it, but ultimately the reason it is decentralizable is that, remember, co-chains are different separate chains, but they run the same consensus protocol. And that means that I can interpret 
one of your blocks the same way that you can interpret one of my blocks. That is why it makes this possible. Let's now talk about token bridges. In token bridges, we have public chains with different consensus protocol. How different? Very different. I mean, proof of work, they're getting proof of stake, a bonded proof of stake, a pure proof of stake. And the problem is now we can, it's not easy enough to interpret each other's block. Because in one place, a block is something as easy as anything, Uzash ends in 70. That's easy. On the other side, they say, if a VRF that I want my individual lottery, and here is my signature, and here is a collection of fast and signature. All this, we cannot easily interpret these ones. So what to do? When, when things go tough, temptation runs high. And what is the first temptation when you find something hard? It's centralization. Somebody shows up and says, I let you interoperate even though you have different consensus protocol. And by the way, I am trusted. Sure you are. So let me give you an example. Assume say, I declare that the asset blue A has been transferred from the blue chain to the red chain. Now that you know that is no longer there, who wants to buy? Bid starts $100 million. And you go, what? Before I spend $100 million for anything, how do I know that the asset is no longer there? Unfortunately, the other chain is a separate chain. I have no visibility inside the different private chain, right? Or um, other, other chain. It says, what? Do you dare to distrust me? Absolutely I do, you centralized creep. Okay. Next. The second temptation is to say, okay, you don't centralize one guy, but now I have seven guys, right? And now if four out of these seven people tell you that uh, an asset has been transferred, well, you don't trust one, but you can trust four out of the seven. Well, but where are these seven people? They seem to me like, you know, the dwarf of Snow Whites. They are. Why this analogy? Because a blockchain that really, if function properly, it should secure trillions of, of dollars in assets. And when you are trillions of dollars in assets, these are seven people who have their own little piggy banks to say, if I don't trust me, if I say something wrong, you can confiscate my money. What do I care about this small pocket change when I have to secure trillions of dollars in assets? It's not enough. Sorry. If it is your money that keeps you honest, when a lot of money is at stake, nobody keeps you honest. So what is the right philosophy? The philosophy that we take at Algorand is the following. First of all, if anyone wants to transfer assets from a blue chain to a red chain, first, she must already trust the blue chain because she has her own asset there. Second of all, she already trusts the red chain because she wants to transfer her assets on the red chain. And the right philosophy is she should not need to trust anybody else, period. Okay, and what is the solution? Is that a centralized token bridge? Let me tell you what the tech is for the centralized token bridge. We have developed a decentralized token bridge by using two main tools. First, smart contracts. Smart contracts must exist both on the blue chain and on the red chain. Hey, but this is a restriction. Listen, if your chain does not even have smart contracts, your users are not able to internally interoperate with each other. And now you want to interoperate with a different chain also, let's be serious. Okay. And the second one is compact chain certificate. What does it mean? These are certificates that they can be interpreted by both sides. And these certificate represents the will of the entire blockchain. Not some witness who says, I trust me, trust me. It's the entire blue chain or the entire red chain that tells you what, um, uh, the truth about what they have. 
So let me tell you with a compact um, uh, certificate, they are, they are organized like this. First, you start with a commitment to all balances of which public key owns how many tokens or asset. And as you know, commitments can be very small. Then, because I want to show you the wheel of the entire chain, I'm going to collect the signature of any statement I want to prove to you from 80% of the stake in your chain. 80% of the stake of our chain. That is not one signature, it's a lot of signature. True. But now we are going to do some matching. I'm going to do a convincing signature reduction. So I'm going to first collect thousands and thousands or millions of, 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 of uh, signature, and then I'm going to reduce them to just say 64. 64 is pretty good. So as long as your smart contract can verify 64 signature, we are done. And so in the way you implemented, we are implementing in, in, in two phases. First as individualized solutions, and second as a universal solution. The first solution are going to be fancy algebraic constructions. And the second solution are going to do fancy use of hash function and only hash function. Why that? And why do I call this universal? I call this universal because hash function are interpreted by any blockchain. Because the hash function is really present in every blockchain because the hash of every block is part of the next block. So if you can manage to express the will of the entire blockchain using only hash function, you are done. Because everybody can be able to interpret it. And by the way, as an added bonus, if you interpret this, uh, you also get the advantage of quantum resilience, which by the way, is going to be important because quantum computers are not here right now, but they're going to be in a few years and you don't want them to mess out the blockchains at all. So stay tuned. We are going to release this technology soon. So let me close again this uh, uh, keynote speech and going to say, let me tell you my take. My take is that blockchains are beautiful but sophisticated goals and they require sophisticated technologies. And it's very, for very good that from all over the world we cooperate to develop this technology. And it's very good that universities and students and people who are, um, uh, we are really technologically oriented are working on it. And let me tell you something about technology. Technology, I believe, is quintessentially human. Ever since we stepped down from the tree to make our first tool, we became more human, not less. Technology is really the creative realization of our aspirations is not on the way, it, it helps us to be, to get, uh, to aspire to, to increase our aspirations. It is our response as complex increases. Somehow the world is becoming more and more complex and even our survival as a species will depend on our ability to develop ever more exquisite and sophisticated technology. Technology is our past, our present and our future. So let me conclude by saying, long live technologies and long live blockchain. Thank you very much. Have a great conference, everyone.